out to walk you through the Monroe's Motivated Sequence Outline example. So this video is going to be about 25 minutes long. This is probably the part of our course that I get the most questions about. It can be very confusing to people. You are supposed to be doing an outline this week, and this outline is covering your speech for next week. An outline is basically a roadmap for your speech. So this tells you where the speech is going. It also tells the audience where the speech is going. So it helps a lot. Keeps you organized, keeps you on track. Make sure that you don't go over the time limit that you're supposed to be sticking to. And the time limit for this particular speech is four to six minutes. So go ahead and watch the next screencast. And uh, if it's helpful to you, you can also print out the template so that you can look as we're going through it and make notes on your template. The template you can find attached to week three's assignment. Okay, enjoy. So you should be seeing my screen and <clears throat> what you're looking at here is page one and page two of a motivational outline. To be specific, this is called Monroe's Motivated Sequence Outline. So the first thing I want to talk about is APA formatting. So when you're doing your papers, all research papers that are done in the university setting, with very few um, exceptions, are in APA format. And what that means is you have to have certain elements within your, your paper. And so this one is a perfect example. So you have your cover page, which is right over here, and you have your title, you have who is giving the speech and who they're giving it for, which is Everglades University. You have your page numbers and you have a page, uh, I don't know what we call this actually, the, the, the title that goes throughout the page. They put this in as a header. I apologize, I, I feel like my brain is foggy today, so please bear with me. So the next page that you have on here is your abstract, and this gives the audience an idea of the purpose of your paper or speech in this example. So this just tells people what you're going to be talking about in the speech. It's just a brief synopsis. It really shouldn't be any longer than this, so maybe one or two sentences and that's it. So then we break into the actual outline. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then your final page, on a separate page, you have your references, and these are in APA format. I'm gonna go through this separately in a different video, exactly how to cite a source, not only within your speech, but also within your paper. There are some um, tools that I can give you to kind of cheat your way around it, and it just makes it easier. It's not really cheating. So everything should be in APA format. You have your title page, you have an abstract, then you have the actual outline, no matter how long that takes you, and then you have a references page, which is your final page, and it should be separate. If you have, um, if you use any kind of visual aid, you should have that listed as a next final page. So after your references page, you would add a an additional page and you would put in there what exactly you have included as your um, visual aid, okay? So that would be APA formatting. That's how I expect your outline to look. So we have page one, page two, and then we jump into the outline, which is where we're going to go now. I'm gonna go through step by step how to put together the outline, and then I'm going to go through each of the individual pieces because you don't, when you start to plan out your outline, you actually don't write it in the order that I would read it. So let me go through that. Maybe it'll make more sense as I go through. Instead of starting with your introduction, you don't start there when you plan out your outline. You start with the body. So figure out exactly what it is that you're going to talk about, decide on your topic, and decide on what the goal is. You are supposed to be motivating people. So at the end of your speech, they are supposed to want to take some kind of action. Okay, so for them to want to take action, you have to tell them what action to take. And I'll go back to the fact that I mentioned um, 
this speech is weighted more heavily than other speeches because this is a speech that you would give in an everyday setting. So it's important that you really grasp the concept and get to know the individual steps of how to persuade somebody and how to motivate them. So an example of that is when you're in a sales meeting and you're talking about, you know, you guys need this particular product. It's going to change the way you do business. This is what your business is going to look like if you buy this product from us. At the end of your speech, you have to ask them for the sale. You don't just say, well, thank you very much for your time, pack up and leave, because then you just gave this whole sales presentation for no good reason. So ask them for the sale. And at the end of your motivational speech, you should ask people to take action. Likewise, if you're in an interview, I realize it's not really a speech setting, but if you're in an interview, at the end of your interview, it's very similar. You need to ask for some kind of confirmation, some kind of feedback from the person who's interviewing you or the board that are interviewing you. So when you are finished with the interview and they say, do you have any questions? First of all, you should have questions. So figure out what questions you want to ask before you walk in. Ask them the questions, and then at the last question say, how do you think I did? When will you be making a decision, and do you think that this, do you think that I may be a good fit for this job? Don't be too shy to ask that question. If you ask that question, you're really putting them on notice that you want this job, and you'll get immediate feedback. That is so helpful and comforting when you walk out of the interview. Because if you walk out of there and you feel like you did terribly and they tell you, you know what, I really appreciated you coming in, but I don't think that this is going to be a good fit for you or for us, then at least, at the very least, you know where you stand. You know that you shouldn't be sitting around waiting for the next few weeks to hear back from them. But most likely they're going to give you some valuable feedback and whether or not you get this job or you have to go on to other interviews, you will know what you can improve upon to get the next job. So it's really, really important that you ask for feedback at the end of your interview. Really important that you ask for the sale at the end of your sales presentation. And at the end of the speech, it's really, really important and you will lose points if you do not tell your audience what action you want them to take. So, when we go through the motivated sequence, like I said, we have the introduction, we have the body, and then we have the conclusion. Where we start planning is in the body. Why do we want to persuade our audience to, to do this thing? Why do we want them to take action? That is the need. There is a need that needs to be fulfilled, and that would be the need step. Um, in this particular outline, she's talking about random acts of kindness and how if each person performs a random act of kindness, we will together make the world a better place. So in the need step, she lays out how there's a problem and we have to fix it. So that is what you do in the need step. What she does a great job of here is she does, she places all of her sources. Remember, you need at least three sources throughout your speech. If you have more, that's great. If you have less, you will lose points. So she does a great job of laying out the sources throughout her speech. She doesn't just bulk them all in one spot. She puts them throughout the speech. So right here, she has laid out one of her sources. So she's given you backup. This helps you to trust in her. And right here, this is how you cite a source within your outline. And you do have to do that within the actual outline, not just at the end of the outline. So she presents this fact. In fact, 17.5 million Americans suffer from depression every year. And that came from this source. So as I'm reading the outline, if I want to, I could just scroll down to the bottom and find where this came from. I know that this came from a, a magazine and is most likely a trusted source, okay? So if I wanted to, I could look further into that source. She's given me all the information that I need. So it's open, it's trustworthy, 
and I feel like I'm still with her. I trust her. I believe her. Okay? So she's laid out the need step. <clears throat> We're going to come back to the transitions because that's one of the things that you do at the end. The next thing she's going to tell us is she's going to tell us how we fix that problem. She's going to help us to satisfy the problem. So she's laid out what the problem is. In the satisfaction step, she's going to lay out how we fix that problem. Again, she lays, she gives me a source within this step. So again, she's splattering her sources throughout the speech, not just in one space. So she tells us that by partaking in random acts of kindness, you can change someone's day for the better. You can give someone a boost of confidence and possibly even save a life or eventually change the world. So she's giving us the satisfaction step. It's easy. You can do it. We can all do it together. Okay? And then the final part of the body is the visualization step. And what we do here is... We tell people, we give them a picture, we give them a story, we tell them what it would look like if we fixed this problem. So there's a problem, this is how we fix it, and this is what it looks like. This is how the world would be better if we fixed it. So it's just kind of a final piece before you ask people for the sale of, you know, this is why you should do it, because things would be great if you did it. Look at this. This is what we see in the world if you do this. So... Often the visualization step starts with imagine yourself because that's what you want people to do. You want them to see how they are fixing the problem, okay? So that's the visualization step. So we went through, because this is the order you're going to plan out, we went through the need step. There's a problem. We went through the satisfaction step. This is how we fix it. And we went through the visualization step. This is what it looks like when we fixed it. The reason that we do it this way is because the introduction and the conclusion will or should be very dependent on what you're going to say in the body of your speech. So if you plan out the introduction first, there's a good chance that you'll get halfway through your speech into the body and realize that you kind of want to take it a different way and your introduction doesn't line up anymore. So we plan out the body of our speech before we plan out the introduction and conclusion. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've laid out the body. Now we're going to go back to the introduction and we're going to lay out the introduction. Another reason we want to lay out the introduction and conclusion last is because we want them to work in sync. If we have the introduction starting off with a quote, for example, and we can finish the speech with a quote, that helps our little brains to wrap things up really nicely and neatly and we feel like we have a complete package. So if you start off with a statistic and you end with a statistic, then your audience knows that it's done. It's wrapped up, it's neat, it's organized, they feel really good and complete with what you've given them. So that's why we want to leave the introduction and conclusion to the last to do together because they should speak to each other. So the attention step is the first part of your introduction. This is where you grab the audience attention. So here she has given a story from uh, one of Jack Canfield's books. So again, another source, she gave it to us right in the beginning, and in her speech she does need to tell us that this came from his book. She can't pass this story off as her own because that would be plagiarism. So she's going to give us an attention getter. She's going to tell us this story, and it's going to grab the audience's attention, and it could be shocking, it could be funny, it could be sweet, it could be anything that is emotional. That's what you want to put as your attention getter. Okay, so then she's going to kind of place it into the speech. She'll tell us how this is relevant to us. She's given us our attention getter. The next part is her credibility statement. This is so important in a motivated speech. Your credibility statement tells the audience how you are qualified to speak on this subject. 
So maybe you've been studying this subject for a long time. Maybe you have actual qualifications where you've got certifications or degrees that back up your knowledge. Maybe you're talking about something to do with flying and you've been a pilot for 12 years. This is where you tell the audience how you are qualified. And if it's just a subject that you're really interested in but you don't have any specific qualifications, tell them that you've done research on this. I have recently become interested in random acts of kindness and by reading several books on the subject, I've learned more about the impact that these acts can have on people's lives. So that tells your audience that this person is qualified because they've done the research. So they're going to give you the information that they have learned. They may not be, you know, somebody out there um, doing random acts of kindness on a daily basis. Uh, they're What I'm trying to say is they're not Mother Teresa. They're just a regular, humble person, but they have done a lot of research and they understand the topic. And that's good because... When you provide your credibility statement, you don't have to be the very best. In fact, coming across as a humble person that is relatable is helpful for your audience because then they're with you. They're like, oh, she's just like me. I understand this. I, I want to believe in her. So if you can give them your credibility and relate to them, then you've won. You've got them. So your credibility statement is really important. It comes directly after your attention getter. And then you give them the preview. For all speeches, you have a preview and a review in the conclusion. And a lot of times students will tell me, but it sounds so repetitious. I'm saying the same thing over and over. But that's only because you have planned this out, then you've practiced it, you've heard this so many times that to you it sounds repetitious. To your audience, you're really helping them to follow the speech. This is four to six minutes, and I hate to say it, but we have the attention spans of goldfish at this point in our lives. With phones and everything else that goes on in our life, we have such tiny, weeny little attention spans that we need people to tell us, what are you about to tell me, then you're going to tell me, and then you're going to repeat it and tell me just what you just told me. So say it over and over again. Give them a preview of what you're about to say, okay? Then, again, we don't touch transitions yet. Once you've got this down, you're going to jump to your conclusion. Now, remember, you gave them, you grabbed their attention in the introduction, you walked them through the need, how you're going to satisfy it, and what it's going to look like once it's satisfied. So in your conclusion, what you want to do is tell them how they, each individual, can take action today, not, you know, sometime in the future, but today on making this, putting this into, into action. I thought I had my phone on mute. I apologize. So you've given them the, you've, grab their attention, you've told them that there's a need, there's a problem, you told them how to fix the problem, you told them what it will look like when you fix the problem, and in your conclusion, you tell them how they personally can fix the problem. Now, the really important thing with fixing the problem is making sure that you give them all of the information that they need to fix the problem. Once again, we are not only tiny little attention span people, we are also very, very, I don't want to say lazy, but we want things now. We need immediate gratification. We, When we buy things, we expect it to be on our doorstep tomorrow. We, we want all of our problems solved today. If we call a company and they don't answer their phone, then we're going to just call a different company. We're not going to wait. We hate waiting. We don't do that. Unfortunately, we have no patience. So, when you ask somebody to take action, you better give them all of the steps that they need to take action. If you want them to call their local senator, you better tell them what his number or her number is because they're not going to do it unless you give them all of the information. The other reason you want them to take action today before they leave the room is because once somebody makes a commitment, no matter how small that commitment is, once they've made a commitment to your cause, you've got them. 
They're on the hook. They feel like they are invested in your cause. No matter how small their investment is, they already feel like they've done something. So let me put that in real world terms for you. Imagine, you know, you have those friends and they they sell something. They sell some product, Isogenics or Rodan and Fields or you know, one of those things that they sell online, like some health supplement or not necessarily online, but they try, we might call it a, a pyramid scheme or we might call it, um, well, we might call it whatever we want to call it, but we have people in our lives that are trying to sell something to us. And so a lot of the time you'll get invited to these um, parties or you'll get invited to presentations online and you know that they're going to be selling you something, but you're a good friend of this person, so you go. You join the party or you go to their online event. Now, once you've done that, once you've taken the step into their world, into their sales pitch, you are invested. Now, you feel guilty if you don't go through with it. So that's their goal, is to get you to just take that first step. That's all they need you to do is just come to the event. I don't want you to buy anything. You don't have to send this on to anybody. If you just open it up, then that's enough for me. But it's not because once they got you to open it up, you feel guilty if you don't follow through with it. So that's kind of what we're going to do with our audience today. We're going to ask them for some small commitment. Raise your hand, sign up the sheet, do something, anything, stand up if you agree. Or if you're questioning your current beliefs, then do this, do that. Something small, make them do some immediate action, okay? So that's the goal of the conclusion, the action step. So to break it down into pieces, remember I said we have to give them a review because we have these tiny little attention spans. So we give them a review. We, we summarize what we just told them. Then we give them the call to immediate action. Ask them to do something right now. And then finally, what we want to end with is we want to end strong so that the audience understands that it's been finished. But you don't want to give a big, long ending because you've just asked them for the action. So that's what we need them to focus on. But we need them to give, we need to give them some kind of a memorable close so that they understand that we've wrapped it up. Um, and so what she does is she says, oh, and by the way, you are a terrific audience because she tells earlier in the speech to um, compliment people more often. So like I said, if you can finish the way you started, that's great. That's perfect. Um, but if you have to give some kind of memorable close that doesn't exactly mirror your introduction, that's fine too. If you could just wrap it up nicely and neatly, that's, you know, that's helping your audience to understand that it's finished. So we've gone through the entire um outline except for the final part once you have all of the pieces in place and now depending on which which program you use you can use word or you can use whatever you need to use what you're going to do is go through and place these transitions and this really helps you the tra the point of the transition is to take the audience from one point to the next point it just kind of leads them so that there's a good strong flow but what it does for you is it really helps you to know how to move on to the next point because I, I'm sure you noticed this when you were doing your introduction. Um, it can get really choppy if you don't have some kind of a transition moving you from point A to point B. So that's what your transitions do. So once you've got everything else planned out, you just simply go in and figure out how are you going to get them from point A to point B. And those are your transitions. So once you've done that, you're finished. You have your entire speech. Now, before I leave you, I'm going to go through some of the frequently asked questions. One of them is, do I write out full sentences? Yes, you do. This is a full sentence outline. It's a formal speech outline. So you would write out full sentences, just one, maybe two sentences. You don't have to write out everything that you would say. Just put in there 
little snippets of what you will say so that I could read this and if for some reason, you know, you were stuck in traffic and I had to give this speech on your behalf, I could do that. Okay, so this example is perfect. She's given one or two. Here she's given three, but you get the point. Just small snippets of what you're going to say, not everything. And then another question people ask is, well, do I have to copy this all out or how do I, how do I use this as a template? So you can use this as a template and simply by just deleting this and writing in what you're going to say. So you would leave all of these here, you would leave your A's, your markers, your A, 1, 2, 3, B, you can leave your credibility statements uh, in parentheses there, you could do that. Just delete this part and write in your own part, okay? So that's how you use this as a template. Um, what other questions? I will go through how you come up with your references, but I want to reiterate that it's very important that you throw your references throughout your speech. Do not bulk them. And the other thing that you need to make sure when you're doing your references is don't ask your audience to do more than one thing. So in your motivated speech, you're asking them to do one thing at the end. Do not, at any point in your speech, ask them to go and research something else. That's not their job. Your job is to present the research to them, to persuade them and to give them everything that they need to believe in what you're saying and take action. Uh, you don't want to tell them, go look for something else because they're not going to. And you're really ruining your own credibility by telling them that because they'll think, well, why didn't she or he do that for me? So. Make sure that you provide them with all of the information. Don't tell them to go look for more information by themselves. Um, I think that is everything that I need to go through for the outline. I know this was a lot, so I recommend if, you, if it makes it easier for you to watch this over and over. If you want to ask me any questions, if you want to set up a phone consultation, I can do that. I'm, I'm available to you guys. Um, and just send me an email. I know we switched over the emails, so hopefully you're still getting my emails. If you're not, uh, I do post into the home page as well. So check that and um, you should see the emails that I'm sending too. So that's enough for today. Have a great day and I will talk to you soon.